Sleep and Sleep Disorders, Part 2. The Physiology of Sleep. Some medical philosophers even say that a person functions in three separate states of awareness. Awake, when the brain and body are both awake. Non-REM sleep, when the brain and body are both asleep. And REM sleep, when the body sleeps, but the brain works very actively, all alone, freed from the body. It's a different brain chemistry, other receptors, other metabolic pathways, and completely different structures, as if we had three separate brains, each working for themselves. I've given some thought as to what is the essential side of human existence, since we are awake, as many of you once wrote, only so that we may satisfy our hunger and sexual drive. We sleep non-REM sleep in order to rest after being awake, where we fight and look for partners. And we have REM sleep where the human brain can at last care for itself. But that's philosophy. Now we have these three recordings. We can see here that falling asleep, we can see clearly see the difference between wakefulness and sleep, the so-called stages 3 and 4, or deep sleep. We can see that this upper recording, the EEG, is scattered. And if we started counting peaks, then there we'd have to around 20 per second. While here, for example, only two. These are so-called slow waves. This discovery, made more or less at the end of the 1980s, consisted of linking the number of slow waves with the depth and quality of sleep. I mentioned earlier that in studying sleep, we can evaluate it not only qualitatively, but quantitatively too. That's what we do when we analyze the number of slow waves. The more slow waves, the deeper is the sleep, and the more regenerative. The fewer there are, the worse a person sleeps. In REM sleep, we see the muscles completely flaccid. Since the brain is working, the muscles must be flaccid to prevent us from running. There are disorders where this turning off of muscle tension is disturbed. A series of now famous experiments were done in the 1970s and 1980s, featuring the famous cats of Jouvet and Morrison, where certain structures in the brain stem and corpus callosum were damaged. Upon beginning REM sleep, the cats would wake suddenly and run around hunting for mice. The researchers determined that they were moving in accordance with the images they were dreaming. We also have an EEG recording just like in the awake state, eye movements and flaccid muscles. This is REM sleep. Ending this philosophical exposition connected with sleep research, I'd like to show you an original printout we obtained from a sleep study. This is a healthy, young, 30-year-old subject, so that we could see what natural and normal sleep looks like. At the top, we have the hypnogram, a description of sleep as seen through the eyes of the researcher using the criteria of Reichstaffen and chaos. That is, a division into separate stages, one, two, three, four, non-REM, and REM. However, on the bottom, we have a graph of the individual elements of this polysomnogram, that is, delta waves. These are the slow waves, which I've spoken about. We can skip the remaining elements of the polysomnogram for now, so as not to complicate matters. Next, we have eye movements, characteristic for the waking state and certain segments of REM sleep, changes in muscle tension, and periods of movement where the subject turns from side to side. What we can see on the basis of sleep, what does this sleep look like? First of all, that it is heterogeneous. It's not like we thought for thousands of years that a person falls asleep at night, wakes in the morning, and nothing goes on between. That's nonsense. Sleep is characterized by being very non-uniform. We can see right away that we sleep deeper and shallower in cycles. We also see that sleep is deepest at the beginning, shallowest near the end, and perhaps that's the origin of the myth that you sleep best before midnight. We certainly sleep better in the first part of the night. We can see a cycle emerge, and in truth the measure of time is a cycle, which lasts about an hour and a half or a hundred minutes. And this cycle is partially dependent on a person's genes. This sleep profile is seen in solitary sailors who cross the Atlantic and are able to designate periods when it's easier to get up and see what's going on with the boat, because each of us has more or less this sleep coded genetically. We can see that the deepest sleep is at the beginning, when, close to morning, REM sleep dominates. So after we've rested and regenerated our bodies, the brain can attend to regenerating itself mentally.
This illustrates the problem of getting out of bed on the wrong foot. If we recall that in deep sleep the body is very deeply asleep, waking someone at the peak of one of these waves is a real ordeal. If anyone, say a doctor, is woken at one or two in the morning, or half an hour after falling asleep, he wakes up unconscious and needs a few minutes to come around, and may even exhibit a disturbed awareness. We call such a state sleep intoxication. It is simply the slow return to full, full consciousness. However, a person woken during REM sleep is immediately active. Everyone who's had a nightmare has woken with the feeling that someone was just choking him or that he was falling into a chasm. And so if we wake someone during their regenerative sleep, he'll surely get up on the left side of the bed. Paradoxically, if he'd woken a half hour earlier, he'd have got up on the right side of the bed because he'd have been active right away. Whether he's happy about it depends on what he was dreaming about, but of course, that's another matter. I'd like to call your attention to one more aspect of physiological sleep, movement. Disorders in movement during sleep is an area of medicine that seems to be becoming fashionable and popular. The relationship between sleeplessness and movement disorders, the restless leg syndrome, that is the free movement of the limbs. Every person moves during sleep. It's natural, and there's no way you can lie in one spot for eight hours. So all of us toss and turn, roll from one side to the other. However, the question of whether there are too many or too few such movements is a more clinical one. It's worth remembering that each of us moves when we sleep. Everyone wakes up for at least a few minutes, and that's just our physiology. In addition to polysomnography, which I've shown here, there is another very interesting diagnostic method for studying sleep, or rather rhythms, and that is rhythm analysis using an actigraph. An actograph is a small device worn on the wrist. This special photo of a young girl shows how easy it is to wear. These actographs are several years old. These days, actographs are considerably smaller, not much larger than, than a normal wristwatch. They are used to record activity. As you can see here, a person is much less active when he is asleep than when he is awake. Not only that, even if there are naps during the day, the activity is still much greater than it is at night. This measurement does allow us to evaluate motion activity over a longer period of time, days, weeks, or even months. We see periods of wakefulness and periods of sleep, and so we can tell that this person slept an hour longer on the weekend than on a normal weekday. We can therefore objectively evaluate sleep. But this method is perfect for studying circadian rhythms. Here we touch upon elements of chronobiology, which is, of course, connected with sleep. Rytmów okołodobowych, tak powiem, już powolutku zahaczamy o, o, o elementy chronobiologii, y, które są też oczywiście związane ze snem, ale na przykład widać, tutaj jak sobie zrobimy... We can see here, when we average the results for the entire month, that this subject lives according to three cyclical rhythms. To end this exposition on physiology, I'd like to present the current concept connected with the regulation of sleep. Państwu aktualnie obowiązujące koncepcje związane z regulacją stu. No bo tutaj dużo na ten temat mówię, mówię o tym, że się bada, badało się w latach 50., 70., 80., ale nie zastanawiam się, czy really why we fall asleep and why we wake? The truth is that we do not know everything yet. No, prawdą jest, że nie wszystko wiemy. Ciągle ten sen zawiera się bardzo still. wiele tajemnic. But our knowledge has expanded considerably over the past 20, 30 years. What were just hypotheses a dozen or so years ago have now been proven. To, co było parę lat temu, czy parnaście hipotezami, teraz już jest jak gdyby udowodnione. Także w świetle jakby obecnie... In light of what we presently know, whether we sleep well, fall asleep easily, wake up properly, and are fully rested, is a physiological state related to three processes. This is a pattern that is very strongly fixed in the biological structure of our brain. There are certain elements that have been shown and proven both in animals and humans. Let's take things in turn. The first process linked to deep sleep regulation is the so-called Ulpradian process. This is nothing more than what I just showed you on the polysomnograph. Alternating periods of non-REM and REM sleep, deeper sleep, shallower, deeper, shallower. This is the cyclical, cyclical pattern of sleep. We know that both REM and non-REM sleep are regulated by special centers in the brain. Each type of sleep has its own nerve cells that, when activated, 
bring on sleep. These two groups of cells are mutually linked. That is, deep sleep activates the neurons that trigger REM sleep, and then REM sleep activates those cells that trigger deep sleep, the slow wave sleep I showed you earlier. Rest during the night is a balancing act between two groups of neurons, shifting from one type of sleep to the other and back again. The other essential process related to sleep is the circadian rhythm. It's nothing more than the fluctuation of sleepiness during the day and night. We all know that if we lie down in bed during the day, even after being awake all night, we won't be able to sleep even half an hour. Our bodies are not set to sleep during the day. They're set for wakefulness. On the other hand, anyone who's tried to stay awake at night knows that there are periods, 1 to 3 a.m., when the brain demands sleep. To be accurate, I should add a hump around the hours of 1 to 3, as research has shown that most people feel quite sleepy during this period. Można powiedzieć, że w większości ludzi w okolicach 13, 15 czy z tego popołudnia mamy bardzo duży poziom senności. Zresztą wiemy, że dużo krajów... There are many countries, particularly those in warmer climates, where people take an obligatory siesta during those hours and life comes to a halt. Życie zamiera. It's physiology, really. Mogę tutaj dodać na marginesie, że... I can add that even in Poland, 30% of subjects admitted to regular after-dinner naps, though they were mostly the unemployed and students who have the time to take such naps. The siesta is not a custom in Poland, but this hump during the day is typical. I might add here that there have been interesting studies accidents, and if we were to compare the circadian rhythm graph with the accident graph, we would see that they correspond exactly. Many more accidents occur when your brain is sleepier. This is our circadian rhythm, which is controlled by our internal biological clock. This clock is not very precise, and we know that it's easy to control, and we can shift our periods of wakefulness. Also, for it to function properly, it must be regulated by sunlight every morning. Light is the clock's strongest synchronizing mechanism. In the absence of light, when a person or lab animal is kept in total darkness, it turns out that the person or animal lives according to a rhythm longer than 24 hours, 25, 26 hours, so that each successive day is longer. The fact that we are able to live according to the geophysical day of 24 hours is due to the fact that our clocks are synchronized every day by light. This is another potential of area of sleep disorders. If we don't have light, and it turns out According to social studies, that people spend an hour in the daylight. When they leave the house, it's dark. They spend the day in a darkened space lit only by a fluorescent bulb, return home when it's dark, so that their exposure to light is limited. This may hint at other reasons for sleep disorders. I'm going a little crazy because I need that natural synchronizer. The third process is called the homeostatic one and explains why we fall asleep at all and how it is that we wake up. From the moment we wake, the need for sleep begins to grow. The biological basis for this need for sleep isn't completely known, but it seems to us that beneath this curve lies endogenous hypnotoxin. This is a theoretical substance not yet discovered, but which may soon be discovered, that collects during our waking hours and brings on sleep. I'll mention several studies done a long time ago. The first such experiments were done a hundred years ago. Animals were deprived of sleep for several days, and a sample of their cerebrospinal fluid was injected into another animal, and it caused the second animal to fall asleep at once. It is indirect evidence that some sort of endogenous substance collects in our brains. It seems to us that such a substance exists and that its level is equivalent to our need for sleep or our feelings of fatigue. At a certain moment during the day, it reaches a critical threshold, and if that coincides with an increased sleepiness dictated by a biological clock, the result is the activation of the neurons responsible for inducing sleep. Then we fall asleep, first deep sleep, then shallower, and after we have regenerated ourselves, reduce the level of this endogenous toxin, and that coincides with reduced sleepiness or increased alertness, 
this according to our internal clock, then we wake up. Thanks to these three processes and their natural homeostasis, we are able to sleep normally, rest normally, while a disorder of any of the three results in sleep disorders. These schematic drawings illustrate an example of how these processes are modeled. All these drawings are based on very reliable scientific experiments. This is an example of a sleep model of a person who doesn't sleep at night. Here we have a normal harmonious chorus where the need for sleep rises, the person falls asleep, sleeps, and that's how it normally goes. But here we have the situation of a person who has not slept, perhaps a reporter or doctor on duty. The need for sleep was not met and continues to climb. The following night, when we do sleep, we sleep twice as deeply, because this graph shows the depth of sleep, the depths of slow waves, and we sleep considerably shorter. This is yet another characteristic of our sleep. Deficits in sleep are made up by improving quality, not quantity. We know that after a sleepless night, the following night we don't sleep 16 hours, only 9 or 10, let's say. But it's much deeper. I often hear people joke saying, I'll sleep every other night and thereby gain a few hours. That's not true. For if we were to repeat this type of shift work, it would lead to various serious regulatory changes. It sometimes happens that we lie down after a night of sleep deprivation. We don't sleep nine hours, but only three or four. And we aren't able to sleep because our regulatory mechanisms have been reset. We can't manipulate our circadian rhythms as we wish. Także tutaj no, nie można bezkarnie tym swoim rytmem okołodobowym, tym swoim spaniem, spaniem szarkać. Now I'd like to show you a few fundamental works that show certain processes of our sleep and our rhythms. This is the work of Kleitman, the discoverer of REM sleep, who was the first to show REM sleep in his laboratory in Chicago, and how circadian rhythms operate in our lives. We can see clearly that a newborn sleeps very irregularly when he feels like it, whereas around the age of four we see a division of sleep at night and wakefulness during the day, although this dip may also be seen in adults. It's worth remembering that a child may not learn the regular rhythm of sleep and wakefulness until the age of five. Here we see how the structure of sleep changes during a person's age. When we're little, our brain needs intensive development. REM sleep dominates, during which the brain learns, matures, and records information. As the brain matures, there is less and less REM sleep. By the way, we see that the older we get, the shorter our sleep becomes. Researchers are divided on the reason for this. Most agree that the worsening of sleep is a natural characteristic. The older we get, the weaker we are. We fall ill more often to circulatory diseases, depression, etc. And so with age, our sleep deteriorates. In my opinion, this point of view is not fully justified or proven. Some evidence points to the fact that this deterioration with age is really a result of increased number of illnesses or ailments, or even the drop in social status in retirement, and not with sleep per se. In other words, even if we're 60 or 70 years old and physically healthy and we have a satisfactory position in society, then our sleep doesn't have to be worse or short. And the third very interesting thing about sleep, about its quality, the mechanism of sleep for us doctors and for everyone who sleeps, is the basic measure of sleep quality is its length. It's found in a simple saying. I slept well, I slept long. I slept short, I slept poorly. We now know that it's not true. How good our sleep is doesn't depend on length but on quality. But the issue of length needs to be addressed too.
A frequent question for reporters is, how long should we sleep? Two, three, five hours? Everyone remembers Napoleon who slept a few hours, and then we had Edison, who slept longer, because Edison was a sleepyhead, and just as smart as Napoleon, so there's no clear rule here. What does science have to say on the subject? Experiments were done by the Swiss in the mid-1980s. In the mid-90s, we in Poland did experiments on the epidemiology of sleep orders and sleep styles of Poles, and the results were identical. It, it turned out that sleep length is a normal biological variable, like weight, height, eye color, etc. And so we also sleep an average of seven to eight hours with standard deviations. We see that on average people sleep seven or eight hours, although there are those who get by on five to six hours, and others who need over ten hours of sleep. It's not surprising, sleep length being a genetically determined characteristic. I can add, sleep quality is affected by slow-wave sleep, known as delta sleep and REM sleep. It turns out that if we were to compare those who sleep 5 to 6 hours with those who sleep 10, the total value of REM and long-wave sleep remains the same. That is, for example, 2 hours of REM for each. Another difference between these individuals is how quickly they are able to shift states. Paradoxically, we can say that the length of sleep depends on how quickly one is able to sleep, how quickly we're able to switch from one group of neurons to another. It's a genetic characteristic. Some people regenerate very well, sleeping only five hours, while others need more time. And this can't be shifted. Of course, many things can be controlled artificially, but that doesn't provide full comfort. One other thing revealed by this research, the red bar is sleep during the work week, while the blue bar represents sleep during days off. It turns out that on weekends, the Swiss, like Poles, sleep an hour longer than they do during the week. All of them, both the long and short sleepers. This is doubtless information about our society. Since we sleep longer on weekends, that must mean we don't get enough sleep during the week, and so we try to make it up. We can conclude that we are a society that doesn't get enough sleep. That's not surprising. After all, we've said about biological clocks and rhythms. We know that our brain and our sleep patterns were formed in response to external stimuli. A person has to live in accord with nature. When it was dark, he went to sleep. When it got light, he woke up. Some very humorous research once estimated that in the Middle Ages, the only people awake at night were guards and thieves, which represented half a percent of society. Presently, we estimate societies that are industrialized, 50 to 60 percent, and even more people work at night. I think everyone watching knows that we go to sleep not when we are sleepy, but when we finish working and gets up not when he's rested, but when the alarm clock rings. That is why, as a consequence, we have permanently disturbed circadian rhythms, which is another reason why sleep disorders are called a social disease, or the disease of the 21st century. That's all for physiology. Now we can move on to sleep disorders and sleeplessness, or we can take a break. Translated and narrated by Roger Domoyalski.